welcome to Hack Circus. This time I talked to Simon Ings. Simon is the culture editor of The New Scientist, which is how I know him, but he's also an author. He's written science fiction books, which you can find on Amazon, of course, and also most recently a non-fiction book called Stalin and the Scientists. Simon has great in-depth knowledge of the Stalin regime and the scientists that try to operate under it, as well as a more kind of abstract theoretical view of the role that science played during that period of history. This is the kind of thing that we talk about in this episode, and I found it really enlightening and absolutely fascinating because I didn't know very much about it. We also talk about art and science and the role that science can play in artistic projects. Hack Circus is also a magazine and a series of events, so if you go to hackcircus.com you can find out about that side of the project and subscribe to the magazine if you are enjoying these podcasts please go to itunes hit the stars give us a rating give us a review if you have time it really does help it oh also i should mention we were trolled by a series of noisy things during the course of this podcast so i have tried to edit it judiciously but i do apologize for any background noise from eg squealing children fountains coming on and off um, a road sweeper who just kept going up and down the same stretch of road again and again for hours and noise in the bar where we where we started which was almost empty except for one person right next to us on the pinball machine you know how it is please (laughs) be tolerant enjoy the podcast and i'll see you next week for another exciting episode Yes, it's rather a nice um, task uh, to be working on the arts desk at New Scientist. It's uh, various and enables me to go to places and into experiences I've no knowledge of and be ignorant but halfway intelligent layperson, which is exactly where the readers are, which is fine. You know, it's my job not to know too much about the art world or be too embedded in it anyway. I remember someone told me once, um, when I was starting to make magazines relatively seriously, um, the editor should know everything about the subject or nothing. (laughs) And that that always comes back to me. I think, yeah, I kind of know what you mean. But then you do find yourself somewhere in between. You 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 know enough to know what's interesting. I don't think it's about knowledge so much as about ethics. If you think you know something, you shouldn't be a journalist. It's a journalist's job to know nothing. Otherwise, what gets you up in the morning? What gets you to ask the obvious question that makes you feel slightly embarrassed to ask it? Which is exactly the question you should be asking. Because you're there and the reader or the viewer or the listener is not. So it's your job to embarrass yourself with the blindingly obvious question. And if you think that you know something about the subject, that's death on a stick. And until you ask the really dumb, naive, obvious question you don't get to unpack that so that's my um so you've held that like that's your strategy ever since yeah has been the touchstone (laughs) of my approach to um stalin uh Mm -hmm. vision all these all these big subjects that i get i get to play among yeah there is something though to be said for that people are used to being approached in a certain way or there's a, a sort of a language that's always used and then someone comes along and asks something completely out of the mouths of babes yes. you just kind of naively go on, not even naively but not necessarily with the right language or with the right kind of the, the politically apposite question yes it's politically apposite it also dates faster than your average unrefrigerated yoghurt and it becomes safe overnight the difficult question about gender, say, immediately becomes a set of assumptions about gender, which is the you know, opposite at the moment we're talking, which it's almost impossible to break out of. And these things acquire their own um, uh, coherence, but more troubling their own um, frames of reference incredibly quickly, so you can't break out of them. And... Um, this, you know, this, I suppose this leads us on to Stalin, because so many good questions were being asked that then became their own orthodoxy. And there's no, there's nobody doing anything wrong here. It's just in the nature of what happens when you ask a difficult question. Is that an awful lot of people then get interested in that, try to unpack it, and it's just in the nature of things that an orthodoxy will be a, a very fast, 
orthodoxy will be created, which you then have to smash through. And the process never stops. You know, never trust uh, a, a professional radical. <laughs> because if you're not tripping over this problem, if you're not falling into orthodoxies and going, oh, I thought we solved that five years ago, you're probably just skating the surface. Unless you're tripping over your own feet, you're probably not deeply enough engaged with the subject to really care about it. I think it's that um, messiness of approach which um, certain political systems are very, very nervous of, and yet that's exactly what you want for a, a vibrant and intelligent and ultimately um, moderate civics the arguments the, um, uh, the the rudeness the incivility are a good sign they're not signs of incipient revolution and disaster they are exactly what you want a healthy civics is extremely brusque and extremely rude and extremely uncivil and if you're running a, an increasingly centralised state, you get very nervous about that, indeed. Because your model of how things work suggests that this is going to blow your own system apart. And it actually doesn't. Um, people always sort of think that, or, that books, novelists are interested in story and character and studying people. And that is all true. But I wonder, thinking about the novelists that I know and people I've spoken to, isn't it also about being slightly obsessed with systems and the way that things work on a big scale, especially if you're looking at thinking about the future and doing science fiction? Or um... The last novel I wrote, which was called Wolves, I set out to write a science fiction book that had absolutely nothing to do with world building in it mm. because I really dislike the concept of world building. I don't agree with it, I don't believe in it, I don't think it has anything to do with the novelist's craft. There is one person on God's green earth, I think, that has a reason to build worlds in fiction, and that's George R.R. R. Martin, and that's because he's a TV writer. He's been a TV writer forever. He's not essentially a novelist, and what he's doing is creating properties for one of the most successful and one of the most interesting um, TV series that there has been in the last 20 years. So when he spends one and a half pages talking about where the sigils go on the flags and who's wearing what, and you want to slash your own wrists, always remember that he's doing that not for you, he's doing that for the production designer. Because if you get the sigil wrong on TV, not only will you get the correctors all over you, but people will notice. And even if they don't notice, it will niggle. And once it niggles, everything starts to slowly fall apart and you only have to be in a screening room with a film that hasn't been completely edited and feel the temperature in that cinema drop by about six degrees when one line of dialogue goes wrong to realise how important that is. Fiction, however, when it's not being produced and broadcast and realised in a mise-en-scene, fiction is not about worlds, it's about change. It's only about change and you cannot build a world and then knock it down it's it's totally pointless what you want are moments of change you need inflection points and by doing that depending on where your points of reference are and what you're concerned about what you will find yourself doing is enabling the reader to build their world and that is why when you read as i did read reviews of wolves which were gratifyingly good and gratifyingly long. I've never had such long reviews of a book before. Uh, I've, I've written much longer books, but I've never had such long reviews. And those reviews unpack books that I did not write. They unpack books that her readers that I've given the readers the tools to build in their own heads. And those reviews ring true. And I think, yes, that is a way of unpacking the book. And that is the point of writing fiction. Fiction is not about your beautiful opinions. And one of the hardest things I find as a practising novelist as well as writing non-fiction and having a, a, a career as a critic now, God help me, is to turn the beautiful opinions off. It's very, very important that I don't appear in the novels in order that the things that concern me manage to escape the notice of my self-censor and end up in the fiction. I'm a strong believer in the idea that if it's not, if fiction 
in the writing of it isn't embarrassing you, you're doing something fundamentally wrong and fundamentally dishonest. It has to embarrass you, it has to undercut you. When critics and readers don't like my lead characters and explain all their faults, there's a certain sort of horrid pleasure in that as I realise what I managed to unpack about myself that has been revealed in this character. So I think in terms of whether fiction reveals a bigger world, I think it does, but I think it does not through conscious application, but by being as honest as you can be. Because if you're as honest as you can be about the characters, this stuff will come out whether you like it or not. This stuff will emerge whether you like it or not. And it means that the process is quite unstable. I mean, Gustave Flaubert wrote... Um, um, Madame Bovary which was if not in his lifetime a huge hit nonetheless recognised by his reasonably highly placed friends as a good book and followed it by an utterly unpublishable 200 pages about masturbation and he followed the same rules for both books so it's a wildly unreliable process How did you get into Stalin? The, the book Began. You've always been a hero of yours. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, no, funnily enough. Uh, not why, I'm not a big fan. On, I'm not a big fan. Than... Well, I do have a Christmas decoration that is a cardboard cutout of Stalin, which has been on the top of the Christmas tree for four years now. Uh, so my son is desperately um, twisted in terms of his politics. He's ten and there's no hope for him. Um, Stalin and the scientists began out of a fascination with someone who wasn't Stalin at all. It was a guy by the name of Alexander Luria, who was a developmental psychologist, a psychoanalyst, and he had to move from discipline to discipline as one discipline after another was prescribed because the characteristic of Stalinist science over and above ideological problems is massive centralisation. So that entire disciplines stab each other in the back in order to survive, just just physically survive, in order to have money to take home at the end of the week. Now, Luria is interesting because he never betrayed anyone and was never betrayed and was never imprisoned. And as far as I... Oh, he was briefly arrested, but that was a farce and an accident and that went away after a couple of days. So his exceptional quality was to lead a normal life. He was able to travel abroad. He had friends abroad. He published papers abroad throughout this time. So I was approached by another Luria obsessive, and this is because Luria invented popular science through a book called uh, Mind of a Nemonist, it's called. And that was the first very successful popular science this uh, editor wanted to know whether there was room for a biography and as I discovered there isn't because in order to explain why this person is exceptional you have to explain why an ordinary life is interesting which is definitely stick to a biography you can't really do much with what looks like an ordinary life so I ended up trying to explain to myself why Luria's career was exceptional and as a consequence I ended up falling in love with a generation of people largely committed socialists um, certainly all of them in support of the end of the Tsarist regime who were active before obedience became compulsory and who created the modern world quite frankly they uh, came up with they developed cybernetics they developed genetics they um, uh, developed management theory they developed ergonomics um, they were ahead of the game in the development of nuclear physics and area after area after area the, so the Soviet scientists were ahead of the game in the West um, those who left the Soviet Union ended up very highly placed in the uh, United States um, and so a lot of the disciplines that we think of as American are actually transplanted Soviet as well as, I mean, everyone knows about transplanted German science, nobody ever talks about transplanted Soviet science, and that was one of the things that happened. 
Um, in terms of genetics in particular, uh, Soviet scientists were able to uh, establish the link between evolution and genetics far ahead of colleagues in the US. So I fell in love with that generation and wondered what happened to them, and hence, hence this book. So how long did it take you to put this together? It's, it's, um, it looks quite a hefty tome. It, it is fairly hefty. It took me four years writing on the bus. I managed... I was working from home uh, happily, if um, impoverishedly, uh, uh, freelance. And I signed a contract for a new novel and a new non-fiction book and then promptly got a job at New Scientist. So I've been writing on the bus for four years. Literally on the bus? Literally like, on the bus. On, a, on an iPad? Literally or? on the bus on a MacBook Air. God bless MacBooks. Oh, wow. Nothing kind of weaved its way in from the, your environment. Yeah, I'm, I'm working on a novel at the moment and I'm discovering the difference between fiction and non-fiction mm-hmm. in... But put simply, is one can be written on a bus <laughs> and one really can't. In as much as this book breaks new ground, I have to be very careful here because, you know, I am sitting on the shoulders of some pretty significant people who've spent their lives researching this stuff and I've, I've come in to distill it, really. Um, in as much as it does break new ground, I hope what it does is to... Um, show science as part of a larger politic rather than make it a, a, a hagiography. You were talking really interestingly about the science fiction scene and the, we were talking about the landscape and the way that the mm. yeah, the yeah. sort of the geography and the, the shape of a country can inform its culture I suppose. Yeah. And the one of the main narratives inevitably Um, for this book is the agricultural narrative which is the attempt to feed um, Russia dogged its history from its inception as a consequence we've got extremely good climatological and uh, agricultural records from Russia because it's always been a problem and it's always been a centralised state as much as it could be in order to try and address that problem. Uh, so we get a sense of the scale uh, from about 800. We've got good records from 800 AD. So a lot of the story is about how the promise of genetics and the promise of physiology, plant physiology, suggested that there might be a quick fix to the Russian food problem uh, because uh, Russia and the Ukraine went through some terrible famines the promise of plant physiology and the promise of genetics to address the food problem got caught up with the essential error if you like of the the early Soviet state and the, the the fundamental error of the state and the fundamental error of Marxism was it presupposed uh, that the uh, 19th century idea that the sciences were all going to join up in this lovely pretty way that eventually everything was going to be explainable in terms of everything else and this was a 19th century dream it was entirely uh, conservative uh, in a small c sense, it's entirely um, accepted that all the sciences will eventually join up. At the point at which different, various different disciplines were going, oh, it's not going to work, is the time at which there is a new political idea developing that regards itself as a science of government, namely Marxism, and says that it's all going to join up under Marxism which is the central humanity around which everything will go here. And what that does, it gives you a sense of tremendous impatience in that you think that the puzzle is about to be solved. And the moment at which you think that is the very moment at which people who are working quite often in the very core disciplines that you need, 
psychology just after the First World War, when you've got a huge orphan problem, got a huge problem of uh, um, uh, mental illness in your population, you've got huge problems with trauma. Uh, genetics and plant physiology, where you've got serious problems of how to try and feed people. Um, these are the very disciplines that are going, it's not going to work. We're never going to be able to join everything up. You're not, for, for example, going to be able to explain psychology in terms of neurology, in terms of physiology, in terms of biology, in terms of molecular biology, and down and down and down through chemistry to physics. It isn't going to happen. It's not going to work. So it's a, a, a terrible... At heart, there's a terrible category confusion going on because science and mathematics and rationality are three really powerful tools. They're not the only ones, but they're three really, really powerful tools by which you can describe the world. But the world isn't built of them. The world isn't built out of mathematics. The world isn't built of rationality. And the world isn't built out of science. And if you think that it is, you're in a hiding to nothing. And, of course, this is what happens... Um, in this most spectacularly catastrophic way under Stalin, in which there is an attempt to explain mind through the tools available, the scientific tools available at the time. And so you have this ever more reductive model of mind. And the real tragedy is that Soviet psychology was really interesting. It was really highly developed. It was far and away ahead of anything that was coming out of France or even Austria at the time. It's, it's taken uh, new Western approaches and transformed them into the most extraordinarily progressive model of education and development. So in the same year that you had Summerhill opening in the UK, you had White Nursery opening in Moscow. And Stalin himself, one of his children, is taught at this progressive nursery, which is using all these new theories of, of developmental psychology. Um, and the thing falls flat on its face because what it can't do is deal with the orphan problem, deal with the trauma problem, deal with the numbers of people who are mentally ill. Um, these disciplines are not going to cohere in a way that is going to save a state which is looking for a quick fix. And the reason it's looking for a quick fix is that it's broke because nobody wants to deal with it. Nobody wants to trade with it. And half the reason they don't want to trade with it is that all their friends have been thrown out of the country or shot. You were talking about, we were talking about landscape and the influence of landscape. And this is, this is what makes any attempt to create a socialist state in Russia such a, a, a tragedy and such a a car crash uh, which you can probably only get a full measure of if you stand a long way away from it to actually to see the full scale of it and that is Russia will never have a, a happy period of capitalism because capitalism in its simplest form cannot work in Russia because Russia is too damn cold the only way you get capitalism is if you can create surpluses in the countryside, which you can then use to invest in machinery in the cities that will produce the machinery that you can then take back to the country to give them, uh, to enable them to industrialise their agriculture so they can create more surpluses, and so on and so on. So you get a nice, virtuous circle which can create the capital necessary to support the urban proletariat that will then take the means of production and create your socialist utopia. That's the way it works. Capitalism is a vital part of that program. And historically, long before socialism ever was dreamt of, the Russians are really mistrustful of capitalism because they're looking at this and going, competition will kill us. We have to have an economy that enables people to survive in sub-zero temperatures for half the year. We have to have, not socialism particularly, but a communitarian philosophy and a way of working, a communal way of working. And capitalism will absolutely kill people. Not, not kill a handful of people, not, you know, kill people over there. Kill us. <laughs> kill the very people who are trying to do it. Um... 
And so you have people like Prince, uh, Prince Kropotkin, who's an absolutely magnificent biologist and whose anarchism, whose anarchist politics <coughs> comes out of his biology, comes out of his study of how living things survive in the Russian North. And he looks at how species work together to survive the winter. And so his anarchism comes out of looking at how the forest, the tiger works, the forests work, and saying everyone has to work together to survive the environment. And he, he looks at Darwin, who, of course, he admires as in, does everyone of his generation and his class and his polit- politic, and goes... You know, Darwin's absolutely magnificent, but this business of competition, it's not actually true. And he's right. Where he is, it doesn't quite work the way that um, British, uh, the, 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 the British commentators at the time describe it. British commentators at the time are quite happy to talk about competition within species because you only have to walk into an English woodland and you see it. Whereas... Uh, Peter Kropotkin is walking out into the tiger and going, no, animals don't behave that way. And they're, they're both entirely right. It's that sort of um, attitude, and I think people don't realise, oh, I didn't really think about it before you said that, that things that you take for granted as science doctrine are actually cultural and from a place and sort of born from a particular, you know, particular circumstances. That, and you say they're both true, um, but they're not both true everywhere. It's like right. a, there is a... There is a truth that is not a general truth. <laughs> yes. Uh, the, 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 the dirty secret, the dirty little secret at the heart of science is that you have to put it into narrative in order to explain it. That science is the popularisation of science. That is what science is, is its communication. Um, anything else is natural history. Anything else is observation. The moment you even create an experiment, you're creating a system that enables you to tell a narrative. That is what an experiment is. Now, that's not to say it's not true. Ideally, it is true. But as any good experimentalist will tell you, it's true, but so limited that you need to put the story in there for it to mean anything. And that's what an experiment is for. It enables you to tell narrative. And unfortunately, the world is not a story. It really isn't. The world is way more complicated than that. Um, and so you can tell, you know, at, at the extreme, you can tell just so stories about why giraffes get long necks, and that's fine. And then you look at hyenas and you go, why does a female hyena have a, pseud- a, a pseudo penis rather than a vagina that is so like a male penis that it takes a good day for them to mate? Um, a third of female hyenas will die in childbirth because they have to give birth through their pseudo penis, and 30% of cubs die in birth. And you, you, you're sitting there going, "What? There is no just so story for that. <laughs> there really isn't." <laughs> or you're really good on the zebra stripes, and you think there are, you know, half a dozen really good explanations of why a zebra got its stripes. They are all almost certainly true, and trying to work out which came first is impossible. It actually, you, you cannot do it. You haven't got the means, the information, the historical record, unless something extraordinary happens. At the moment, even knowing about, you know, even knowing what we know about mitochondrial DNA and all the rest of it, you still can't unpick it. You're never going to be able to explain why the zebra has its stripes because you can't put it into narrative. If you spend your life working on it or read 13 books, you'll, you'll get it, but you still won't be able to tell somebody in the pub. And um, one of the problems with assuming that every science can be explained in terms of every other science is that it opens the window up to saying everything can be explained in terms of narrative. And this is what happens to a generation of early Soviet philosophers who effectively simply become cheerleaders for the state because they have been tasked with explaining all sciences in terms, of ev- in terms of each other. And in the end, all they can do is trot out explanations of why the boss knows best. They can only trot out party lines because their job is literally impossible. They didn't start out cynical, but they became cynical 
because the task that they were given, which was to describe the world in terms of narrative, and a single narrative at that, what, what were they supposed to pick? Of course they picked the government line. There was no other line to pick. Um, and you have these extraordinary, self-serving, without a doubt, narratives of uh, philosophers. Once Stalin is in his grave, who late in life and having sent a good many people to the Gulag, because these people were powerful, very, very powerful, rediscover what it's like to do philosophy and rediscover what it's like to do science. And there's one particular uh, character, Ernst Coleman, who was perhaps the most vicious of Stalin's um, uh, media spin doctors, who was a philosopher, who quite late in life stumbles on the Soviet brand of cybernetics and suddenly has the opportunity to do some real work. And he's not a nice man and it is undoubtedly a self-serving memoir that he has written and yet it is extraordinarily moving weirdly this is not someone who suffered this is someone who did quite well although he was thrown into prison at the end as most people were um, suddenly rediscovering what it is to be open to the world and to be prepared prepared to accept that an idea you have can be true and incomplete you know um, the, the, the problem is where you have a philosophy that says it's not true until it's complete and connected to everything has it made has reading about all these kind of um these people who went through these terrible experiences has it sort of given you um, an appreciation of your own freedoms I suppose is what I'm saying or has it, has it made you more aware of all the things that you can do and think and write and publish and, or is it the other way around has it made you more aware of the, the parallel restrictions in our society the latter really yeah it's made me realise how unfree we are it's also made me realise the, the the necessity but also the impossibility of this idea of freedom it's made me question whether freedom is remotely interesting and remotely useful and remotely helpful. Um, it's, it's impossible to listen to a news broadcast now without biting my hand when you hear... Um, you get very good at reading the rhetorics of how politicians talk about science. The problems with New Labour was that it thought it could met- metricize the job of government and promptly generated a zillion and one perverse incentives in what it was trying to do. I mean, that was a a very um, uh, sort of lavender, comfortable version of the um, uh, socialist programme. It was the sort of um, of fustian, uh, pipe-smoking idea of well, you know, we don't need to go too far. We, we just need to metricize and then have people act rationally. And evidence-based government. I can't think of anything more terrifying than evidence-based government. Uh, evidence-based government. The last time that was tried, that was Lysenko. The last time we had evidence-based government, that was taking uh, the food, um, uh, the the food provision of one of the largest states on earth, and rendering it inoperable. Because don't think for a second that that was not based on evidence. It was based on evidence. It was based on the evidence of thousands and thousands of questionnaires sent out in good faith to communal farms saying, how is this process going? And these communal farms have received this questionnaire. Not only have they received your questionnaire, they've received a dozen other questionnaires from other people who also, in goodwill, have sent you their questionnaire saying, how is this innovation going? And the people who are running these farms, with goodwill, are frantically trying to fill them in. And they don't really have time, and so they skirt around the edges. And they're also aware of where their funding comes from. So it's like... 
what what went wrong with this business of chilling grain and soaking it and letting it go mouldy and not having the um, the manpower to turn the grain over at the right time and not having the machinery to carry this soaked grain that weighs twice as much as the grain that we had before and sowing it into fields. Uh, uh, who are we going to blame here? Are we going to blame the process itself? Or are we going to blame the factory that didn't send us the extra tractor? Are we going to blame the uh, electrician that wasn't able to provide us with the power to refrigerate our grain? Are we going to blame the local council that haven't put the grid in for us? There are so many things that you can explain why something went wrong. Are you really going to say, well, actually, I think scientifically this is probably a bad idea. It's not even going to enter your radar. It's not even going to enter your head to do that. You're not even going to ask that question because you're too busy running around going, oh, how are we going to get the refrigeration working? So the whole of that absolutely catastrophic business of um, vernalizing grain that Trof- Trofim Lasenko, the famous, you know, the, the, the notorious uh, faker and charlatan introduced into Russia, that was based on evidence. <laughs> that was a state desperate to feed people, sending out questionnaires and getting false positives back and going, fantastic, we'll do it some more. That's what citizen science looks like. That's what evidence-based government looks like. Um, it's terrifying, you know. It's um, so many... It's, the assumption that the Soviet project was cynical is probably the worst mistake. It wasn't cynical. It went wrong for good reasons, and it's reasons we absolutely have to learn. Because if you think those people weren't thoughtful and weren't committed... I mean, never mind the fact that Stalin was a lunatic. Yes, this is true, and this is... This is what muddies the waters. But there are an awful lot of people really trying to do a very good job that absolutely destroy the, um, the, the means of production of food, that absolutely destroy uh, the uh, uh, mental health provision, um, that absolutely destroy um, the uh, provision of workplace safety and security, despite the fact that they were foremost in developing safe factories. It's It's... Um, it's not been the, the 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 easiest four years writing this. It's it's a grim story. There's no there's no way round the fact that it is a very very sad story. Your job at the New Scientist is sort of um, well culture editor. So you go to see a lot of art and cultural things that are to do with science. Um, I'm, I'm interested in how do you... I'm, I'm personally invested in this as well, obviously, but I'm interested in how do you make art about science without um, either just kind of doing a creative science experiment or doing an illustration of a science fact. Like, is there a thing that you've seen that you think did it really well? If it's not asking difficult... If it's not making you feel uneasy it's probably not doing its job if it's not asking you well what is the difference between this and a natural science experiment i'm not sure it's really um finding its strength i think that all art needs some kind of friction to work against and i think there's a lot of friction to be had between different ways of looking at the world um it's easier to say what I don't think works and a lot of what at the moment I don't think works is this is not to do with an, uh, the, Im- the embedding of science within art but it's actually a much more general point which is the embedding of, of art within academia if I see one more show which is an object that distills someone's six month reading list look at me, I've researched something you know, I'm going to put my foot through the bloody screen, I'm really sick and tired of people who've been given, you know, I I grant you very small grants, bugger all money but have been given something in order to read books for six months then producing an object that says this is a distillation of my reading books for six months, oh come on, you can do better than that, or how about just read books for six months and stop (laughs) 
S- stop the world with about plastic crap. <laughs> f- filling the world with these objects that only you can unpack. And we're supposed to be impressed that you read someone else's book. Give it a rest. Uh, that irritates me. And that's not to do with science. That's to do with academia. That's because it's easy to judge. That's because it's easy to measure. So what I find are the most successful works for me at the moment is art that says, OK, we want to metricize the world. This is what the aesthetic of that world is going to look like. And it's quite often ugly, and it quite often doesn't look like art at all. It quite often looks like a, a bulletin board. It quite often is a bulletin board. That interests me, because that's saying, what kind of uh, human response are we going to get out of a world that's this reduced, that's reduced to these factors? And it's interesting, because it looks very new, but I think, rhetorically, it goes back at least to the 1940s and the 1950s and the work of Stanislav Lem, who is, who is exceptional as a futurist because he actually cares about what the aesthetic is going to be and what the ethic is going to be and what happens to ordinary people within that environment. And it's why I, it's why I like your work, which doesn't look like art very often, that looks like a bread looks like and often is a presentation Um, so when you were doing the work with um, the um, um, uh, the Rombert Dance Company which is let's not have work that just renders the the expression of dancers into a glyph but let's see what the technology can actually do to increase to enable human expression and you don't, you don't come up with answers for that, and that's what no. I quite like, because, frankly, if you came up with answers, it wouldn't have been a good enough question. Yeah. It's, that, no, it's that, that tension, it's that interzone which excites yeah. me. And you have, to be able to, um, you have to be able to let other people in. I think if you just say, this is the, yeah, this is the solution, <laughs> I've created the thing, now work out what the question was almost, like, where did it start, how did I make this? Whereas, um, a bit like what you're saying with the, the communal aspect that's kind of necessitated by the... Uh, the the hostility of the environment in Russia that there is a sense that you have to reach out and allow other people to help you to evolve in that you know use that um, kind of analogy of the the Darwinist evolution thing um, but yeah I think I think that's the kind of thing and that's why you get maybe why you got these um, these futurists coming from Russia who did the most extraordinary collaborative magazines you know and I always make magazines so I kind of feel like Oh, there's, there's something that I feel a bit like I understand that a little bit um, but there was a fantastic futurist magazine exhibition on at the British Library a few years ago did you see that? yes That's great I love that yes. so good and there is an aesthetic but there's also an openness of like I'm just going to demonstrate all these possibilities in my, of my thinking and then you can just come in wherever you want and you know and uh, this is what they understood perhaps because they didn't have the resources to make the obvious mistakes they simply had to throw everything at the, they, they wanted to create or at least a, the, the Bogdanov um, half of the Bolshevik movement wanted to create a genuine proletarian culture and they did it by giving people the means of production and exposing them to the best work that they had available. And that was it. That was it. There was no attempt to make anything accessible. Accessibility, I reach for my gun. You don't need to make things easy. You simply need to expose people to them. And you need to listen to what they say. And as a consequence what you get out of that period of um, uh, which, which didn't last long that period of Prolog Cult with its magazines with its extraordinary success where you had every factory having its own uh, orchestra uh, its own magazine you had opera societies in Archangel for heaven's sake which is a shack in the middle of nowhere um, on, you know on the northern seaboard in the Arctic um, what you get are the first stir- stirrings of an entirely new aesthetic because these things generate really quickly because it's what people do 
we're hardwired to generate culture. It's one of the things that we produce. And th the worst thing you can do is police it. The worst thing you can do is to assume that people will find it difficult. People do not find culture difficult. That is the most exciting part, I think, of, of, of what I found was the intersection of science with that movement. The idea of citizen science. The problem is, okay, that's a lovely idea, but the, the man who tried to institute it within Prolet Cult created a, 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 a blood transfusion service that gave someone syphilis and then killed its founder and the overall government attempt to use citizen science to um, revolutionise the um, system of agronomy within the Soviet Union placed uh, a huckster at the centre of its process and kept that huckster Trofim Lysenko in place until the mid-1960s so you have to ask yourself it's a lovely idea but does it really work one walks away going in two directions at once you become an anarchist and you also become quite conservative <laughs>